Thanks very much, Cindy. And thanks everyone for joining us today. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, How to Implement Cultural Competence and the National Standards for Class. This is the second in a three-part series. Our presenter today is Harold Gates, President and Co-Founder of the Midwest Center for Cultural Competence. about the ATTC network, we have a new tagline that we think explains what we do pretty well. We help people and organizations incorporate effective practices into substance use disorder treatment and recovery services. <clears throat> about the Great Lakes ATTC, we're based at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and we cover HHS Region 5, that's Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. To find out more, you can visit our website, as you can see on the screen. Well, okay. A couple notes about today's broadcast. The audio will be broadcast through your speakers, so please make sure that they're turned on and up. And about the presentation slides, you can check the file pod at any time and click on the presentation link to browse to the file. In this webinar, we're going to be using the chat and questions feature for some interaction that you can have with the presenter. And we'll also have a Q&A session after the presentation. I want to tell you a little bit about our presenter, Harold Gates. He is the president and co-founder of the Midwest Center for Cultural Competence, which is based in Sun Prairie, Wisconsin, just outside of Madison. Harold's been consulting since 1989. He holds a master's degree in social work from the UW-Madison and a master's degree in Chinese studies from Washington University in St. Louis, with a BA in Asian studies from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. Harold has served as a cultural competence consultant and co-chairs the Cultural Competence Strategic Planning Committee and the Wisconsin Department of Health Services Division of Medicaid Services. Now I'd like to turn it over to our presenter. Thank you, Maureen. Welcome, everybody. And uh, to those who are on this for the first time, Welcome, and for those of you who were here last time, uh, great to see you on as well. Uh, just a couple things before we get into the basics of the webinar today. I'm hoping that a few of you who were here last time were able to look at the uh, cultural competence self-test, because that's one of the things that I'll refer to from time to time, and as well as the last presentation in August. But it will help you get a better sense of what your strengths are around cultural competence overall uh, in terms of your physical environment, where you work and where you practice, uh, communication styles and values and beliefs, those kinds of things that you can see where you're doing well and also challenges and things that you might want to work on. The other thing that we included uh, in the first webinar was uh, standards, national standards for culturally and linguistically appropriate services. Uh, and that's something I'll refer, I'll refer to in this uh, workshop. And also the class assessment tool that uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health has put together. And I think it's a great tool to help you look at your organizational needs and areas where you're strong and other areas where you might want to put in some more effort and come up with an action plan. And we'll talk more about that on the third webinar as well. So with that, um, We'll get started. The learning objectives for today, we're going to be looking at it initially from a clinical uh, therapeutic perspective, but we'll also refer to some organizational things uh, as we get into it. But to uh, understand the importance of incorporating culture, uh, your client's culture into intake and assessment, evaluation, and treatment planning. Uh, and a lot of this information comes from um, one of the great tools I think 
you should look at if you haven't already downloaded the Price is Right. It's free, uh, but it has a lot of good information that the webinar from today was taken from, but it's even more detailed than what we'll be able to cover today. So tip 59 is available for you to get off of SAMHSA's website, and I would encourage you to do that. Uh, it's very useful. So the core competencies uh, that I'm going to focus on today that are also from TIP is self-knowledge, like how much do we know about ourselves and our cultural background and the highs and lows of that and, you know, how we value things or things that we see as issues that other people might not. Cultural awareness, how aware are we of how our culture informs our day-to-day -day life and our professional life. And then counselor competencies, uh, things that can help, help us uh, intervene appropriately in terms of our own attitudes and beliefs, knowledge and skills. And most of us have heard, some of you maybe more than others, that most professions now have some standards around cultural competence that we should be doing our best to practice on a regular basis and continue to grow and develop and evolve over time. So these are uh, areas are broken down into nine different steps that we've covered this morning, uh, and I'm looking at them in terms of the initial ones, one through five being uh, more clinical or therapeutic uh, ways of being with clients, and then the part, uh, second part, six through nine, is looking at some of the things that are not only part of the work, work that's being done to work with people with substance use disorders, but organizational things that could be in place as well. So. Let's kind of just look at those individually. So uh, the best way to engage a client, uh, obviously establish some kind of rapport with people when they come in before you launch into your series of questions. Uh, draw attention to the presenting problem without uh, being, becoming overly involved in understanding what the problem is. How do you get information but not too much at one time? Uh, third, ensure the client feels engaged uh, and comfortable with any interpreters that might be used uh, during the intake process because uh, obviously some of our clientele, English is not their first language or they have low literacy skills or they might have a disability that we need to pay attention to as well. Uh, and then lastly, use a culturally responsive interview process such as LEARN. And I'm sure some of you have heard about this particular concept. It's not the only one, but it's one that I uh, just picked out for today. Uh, listen uh, to each client for, from his or her own cultural perspective. Explain the overall purpose of the interview and intake process, because a lot of people are not familiar with that necessarily. Acknowledge a client's concerns and discuss the probable differences between you and your clients. Yeah, we, we don't all think and do and appreciate things from the same perspective, so how do we keep that in mind and acknowledge that? Recommend a course of action through collaboration with the client, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, but, um, you know, it helps if we're all working together for the same purpose. And then lastly, negotiate a treatment plan that weaves the client's cultural norms and life uh, ways into treatment goals, objectives, and steps. So that's the learn model and overview. So with that, let's, let's give it a little practice. So there's a client scenario I'd like for you to tune into, and I'll read it, and then you can respond and tell me what you think. Um, so your client is a 52-year-old Filipino woman whose husband has died two years ago. She has a history of digestive and related disorders. She admits to drinking several glasses of wine every night, though she hasn't even hasn't ever considered whether it's a problem. So given that, how would you apply the LEARN model to this situation? So I'll give you a few minutes to think and figure out how you might apply the LEARN model. So if you could uh, chime in on the um, chat spot there, that would be great. I see a few of you are 
uh, going ahead and typing in. We'll wait for you so we can read some of their comments on the case studies. But just know we'll also head back to that main chat pod, and I will uh, let you know how you can access that first webinar. I think someone asked that. So you have someone just asked, uh, what's her cultural view on drinking wine? That's a, uh, that's a good point. Listen and ask questions, establish a rapport, great. Why is she coming in to see see you in the first place? Would be maybe a place to start. And then listen to how she's explaining her concerns, digestive issues as related to drinking. Yeah, you know, that's certainly tuning into people's uh, biological issues or medical uh, issues might be one way to look at it, as, uh, you know, also. Uh, acknowledge her loss. Uh, that that might be certainly um, a major reason why she's doing what she's doing, or we don't know that, so we can ask more questions. Uh, here's a good one. Uh, ask also how life has changed since her husband's passing. How do you deal with what with that stress, and not start with the wine right away? That's a good point. You know, how do we not turn people off our uh, stigmatize them or whatever, because uh, we don't really know until we inquire more about what the person's concerns are and why they might be coming to see us in the first place. Rapport is needed. Uh, they often do not trust and may not answer questions. Excellent. Uh, here's a good one. How does the cu her culture or community process and deal with grief? Excellent. So, good one. Uh, discuss safe drinking levels for women in their age group and standard drink sizes. I think that's a lot. That sometimes people don't necessarily even know that or think about that, depending on the circumstances. And one last one, uh, ask her how her family is adjusting to the loss as well as due to people possibly changing after a loved one dies. And various cultures deal with that, obviously, in different ways. What do we know about that and how can we tune into that to assist that person with uh, what they're being challenged with? So um, I'm going to stop there, Cindy, and we can you can continue to chime in, but we're going to move on to the next area. And thanks, everybody, for uh, your uh, comments. We certainly have quite a number. I couldn't obviously get to them all. So the next piece of the <clears throat> model I mentioned at the beginning uh, in terms of culturally responsive evaluation and treatment planning is familiarizing people our clients and their families with treatment and the evaluation process. Again, not everybody uh, is familiar with the process, so how do we help them with that? Uh, it's important to the client's overall success in treatment to educate them and their families about the treatment expectations and processes. And lastly, education about the treatment culture should start with the initial intake and interview. Doing this at uh, this point in the process uh, helps a lot of times with engagement and retention, especially with uh, clients who are racially and ethically diverse. So f familiarizing folks with the process and procedures is a good thing. The next uh, part of the process is uh, endorsed collaboration and interviews, assessment, and treatment. So the initial interview and evaluation can be intrusive and sometimes can contribute to shame or dishonor, and that's definitely going to be a challenge some, from time to time, depending on what the person's cultural background is. And substance abuse uh, treatment counselors can uh, get rid of some of the client's fears and concerns 
by t taking a collaborative approach to the process. So how are we going to work together? What are we, um, how are we going to help you and what do you want to achieve in this process? Doing it in a collaborative way or mentioning that is certainly going to be useful. So what is the collaborative approach or what does that look like? <clears throat> Excuse me. Be sure to allow time with the client to discuss expectations, yours and the uh, client's expectations. Explain the interview, intake, and treatment planning process. Um, emphasize the importance. The importance of the client's input and interpretations of things. Uh, be inclusive of the client's preferences and desires, uh, especially regarding uh, family and community members being involved in the evaluation and treatment planning process. You know, not everybody sees the process from the same perspective, and sometimes uh, people want family members or significant others or community members involved with this. So, how do we? Consider that and keep that in mind. And then lastly, acknowledge the client's strengths and, and supports, such as their social skills, whether they're bilingual or multilingual, their spiritual and religious practices, generational wisdom, extended family, cultural heritage, coping skills, and community involvement. Some of those things could be very useful in terms of collaborating with our clients uh, throughout this process. So with that, the collaborative process or collaborative approach, let's take a look at another scenario. So this scenario, uh, your client is a 24-year-old uh, indigenous man who lives in a, on a reservation in northern Wisconsin, using an example from here. Uh, he admits to drinking a lot on weekends, and he has high blood pressure and high cholesterol. He's also used marijuana and methamphetamines. So what steps would you take to ensure you're using a collaborative approach when working with this client? So again, the collaborative approach being, discussing expectations, explain the process, emphasize input and interpretations for both the clients and yours well, the clients in particular, include preferences and desires, like who, who should be involved, how do they want to be uh, do process the treatment planning and evaluation phase, and then acknowledge strengths and supports. So what do you think? Um, this is a good one. So determine the person's his interest in changing any of these behaviors, and we'll kind of allude to that as we get a little bit more into the webinar. But yeah, where is that person in terms of their change process? Does he have a doctor? Will he sign a release to speak with that person, him or her? First, establish permission for asking questions and then ask about family history in regard to drug use and determine any strengths and work off of them. Very good, excellent. Identify how he views these issues and not assume that he views it as a problem. Okay, that's a good point. What, what does he get out of his use? Uh, you know, one of the things that we can talk to people about is the benefits and consequences of use because there's obviously some benefits so they wouldn't be doing it, and there's also consequences, and are people aware of that, of those? To discuss the client's health and how substance use is contributing to the, the decline of same. Very good. How does a person's use affect the family? And what worries you about your current situation? So some good points that you raise. Uh, discuss what 
what he wants to get out of a treatment. Does he prefer a male or female counselor? Very interesting. So, um, yeah, um, a very good uh, points you're raising. And I have another question for you briefly. Um, and I meant to mention this earlier, too. As you think about some of these the parts of the process of being, uh, working with a client, think about some of the class standards. For example, this one I was thinking that uh, in the area of continue, engagement, continuous improvement, and accountability, there are some standards 11, 12, and 13 that might relate to this particular scenario. For example, 11 is collect and maintain accurate and reliable demographic data to monitor and evaluate the impact of class on health equity outcomes and to inform service delivery. 12 is conduct regular assessments for community health assets. And 13, partner with the community to design, implement, and evaluate policies and practices. So uh, one of the things I think is, again, useful from an organizational perspective is looking at the standards and how they relate to the practical application of these kinds of things and working with clients specifically. So just some things to think about and look at again from the materials you got from webinar uh, one. So thanks for everybody for chiming in. Uh, we might be able to touch base on some of these uh, at the end in our Q&A uh, session as well. So let's move on to the next one. Thanks again for chiming in. So another piece of the process, uh, the first part of the uh, process that we were alluding to is how to integrate culturally relevant information uh, and themes. So we can ask questions about culture and race that uh, relate to uh, the intake process. You know, where, where are people coming from, their country of origin? Um, Immigration status, uh, you know, that's certainly a really major concern right now for a number of reasons. Um, how to um, length of time in the United States, a lot of times those are things that we can ask our clients about, you know, in terms of where their parents were born, how, they, um, how that affects them, what languages do they speak at home. And, a lot of these kinds of questions are important to get information about their degree of acculturation and cultural identity and the ties that people have with their culture. So these are some of the things uh, that are worth touching base on to get more information and to get to know your client a lot better. Another point to keep in mind is that uh, few evidence-based practices have been tested with minority populations. Uh, one of the groups that I was familiar with from the past is the Nathan Klein Institute in New York State that had done a monograph on evidence-based practices and how do you also look at cultural uh, components when you're doing that. And I know one of the examples they used was a study they did in Hawaii with some of the local uh, indigenous people uh, in terms of how they were uh, impacted by certain issues. and. Uh, they looked at it in terms of the culture and how evidence-based practice could be modified in order to include that. So that's a source you might want to check out at some point, the Nathan Klein Institute. They have a website that you can check out, and if you need more detailed information or can't find it, um, you can always email me or let us know, and we'll figure out how to post it on the, uh, the website as well. So let's move on. <clears throat> uh, five, gathering, gather culturally relevant collateral information. And there's a tool that uh, discovered in looking at some other, uh, other work that has been done around uh, cultural competence in class, and that's a cultural gram for mapping the role of culture. And it has, um, it's one way for you to gather information um, and it's helpful in understanding people's backgrounds and their families' backgrounds. So there are 10 areas that are included in questions specific to the client's life experiences, 
as well as questions about their family history. Uh, and so you can take a look at the uh, diagram here. And we have a reference for that that we'll post uh, later. That's uh, something you can go online and take a look at and check out this tool. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with it, and some of you might not be. Um, the cultural program also can be used as a guide uh, in your interview, initial interview, your counseling session, or in clinical supervision sessions with uh, clients to get more culturally relevant uh, multi-generational information that might be unique to that person and their family. So again, the cultural gram, uh, I think it's a good tool to take a look at as part of our um, culturally responsive evaluation and treatment planning process. So if we move from this one to the second piece that, uh, again, is relevant not only to uh, uh, the counseling or clinical process, but uh, to the organizational piece, is select appropriate, culturally appropriate screening and assessment tools. Uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of those, but I picked out a, a, keep a few and some comments about those just to put out there, and then you can respond. But screening uh, instruments that ask clients about their guilt, about drinking, could be ineffective with people uh, from cultural, ethnic, or religious groups that expect complete abstinence from alcohol or drugs. And there are uh, cultures, groups, and religions that actually emphasize that. So, um, you know, what do you, how are you um, able to figure out screening tools that are appropriate, if that's the case. Uh, in 1990, some research was conducted by a couple of folks that found that the short Michigan alcoholism screening test was highly sensitive to individuals who use alcohol in traditional Arab Muslim society. And then one question on the test, do you ever feel guilty about your drinking, failed to distinguish between people with alcohol dependency disorders in treatment and people who drink in the community. So, I mean, these are cultural issues that might be unique to uh, certain cultures and people from different backgrounds, uh, and that's worth considering and uh, thinking about when you're uh, figuring out what are appropriate screening and assessment tools. Another part of this is um, some, there are some particular tools that I'm going to mention that I'm sure some of you are familiar with that look at, again, this whole process of what's going to be useful as we look for people that have challenges with substance use disorders. And CAGE, C-A-G-E, uh, is one that is used, uh, you know, it's pretty uh, well known for this particular area because it has four questions that are used to detect possible alcohol use disorder. So again, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with that. And then the Composite International Diagnostic Interview um, Substance Abuse Model Module uh, that was put together by Kotler in 2000. And this one looks at uh, detailed interview diagnosis, excuse me, yet diagnosis of uh, substance abuse and dependence. And it's expanded, that's an expanded version of this tool that's used um, as well. So those two things, those two particular assessment tools are ones that have been mentioned, but obviously there are many more that you could use and that might be appropriate for your particular clientele. And, I always, again, go back to the demographics. Who are we working with? What do I know about them? And what don't I know about them so I can continue to uh, grow and become more culturally competent in terms of my skill level, knowledge, skill, and awareness around uh, providing uh, excellent service to my uh, clientele. Let's move on to another, de determine readiness and motivation for change. And someone alluded to that earlier. Uh, 
is the person coming because they're court ordered or they have to be there or are they coming because they know that they have a problem and they want to deal with it? Um, or what, what are the reasons for why people are coming and how do we do that? And one of my all-time favorite models to use for this, and there are obviously other ones, but um, understanding the stages of change and using a strategy like motivational interviewing can help counselors prepare culturally diverse clients to change their behavior as well as keep them engaged in treatment. Uh, and then one of the things, a couple things that are useful about that uh, process is figuring out where people are. Are they, are they at a pre-contemplative phase or are they already moving into dealing with their issues uh, and ready to move to another phase and to uh, even maintenance, which would be the ultimate but where, where are people in terms of their motivation to change? That's one way to look at it. And uh, motivational interviewing, I, I remember, also not only talks about how do you deal re with resistance, but it talks about, um, you know, the, the, con the benefits and consequences of use so that you can talk with a person about what they're doing so that hopefully they can start to get some insight into um, yeah, I do it because it helps me relax or relieve stress, but uh, yeah, I have diabetes and maybe I'm uh, affecting my health by continuing to drink or use drugs. Uh, so how do we know that we can ask people questions in such a way that helps them weigh, look at what they're doing so that they can come to some place where they want to deal with it. And, you know, the challenge always is they don't have to be where I think they should be. In fact, it's, it's where are they in terms of how they want to deal with this and how do I help them with that process. And I think motivational interviewing, in my opinion, is one of the best <clears throat> models or methodologies, counseling techniques. There are others, again, but it, it helps with people's cultural perspectives because they're telling you what they want, where they're at, and how they want to deal with things. And it's not what you think. Uh, the interventions also can uh, not only assess people's stages of change and technique, techniques that can help them move forward, but um, it's a non-confrontational and client-centered approach to treatment, which helps create relationships between yourself and your clients. And that's key because all of us know, I think we can uh, agree for the most part, that none of us really like to be confronted. Uh, it's, it's definitely a, a turn off for a lot of people. So this method helps the person, uh, in most cases, move to some sense of how things are impacting them so that we're not having to confront them with the issues they're looking at themselves and figuring out where they're at and how they want to deal with it. So determining readiness and motivation for change, I think, is just critical in terms of helping people no matter what their cultural backgrounds or beliefs, um, this particular one. And then there's some mindful-based techniques and cognitive behavioral therapy and other things that might be useful. But I think uh, motivational interviewing is one of the top in terms of helping people deal with any substance use disorder. And also it's a process that I think is very user-friendly for the counselors as well. So getting into some more of the management pieces, how do we provide a culturally responsive case management process, or is that something that you routinely do? Is it something that you could do a better job at? Could you look at some of the class standards to help get more focused on where you're at with that process? But clients from diverse racial, ethnic, and cultural groups sometimes face additional obstacles when seeking treatment. And you know, we only have to uh, think about the opioid epidemic and how it's affecting various groups of people. But, uh, you know, how do, how do we even get in touch with that? And what are the barriers to people getting treatment? Uh, is it, are we more or less criminalizing things? Are we, are we opening up things more for uh, an empathetic, compassionate approach? And are, do we even have treatment facilities enough to go around for people that really want the help they need. 
So that's something worth thinking about in terms of case management. The, the obstacles that are presented for people to get into treatment uh, may interfere with, with or prevent them from receiving treatment and also services that are accompanying that. Uh, it might compromise appropriate referrals. Uh, it might also uh, hurt them in terms of compliance with treatment recommendations or produce tr uh, poor treatment outcomes in the process. So again, case management, how are we looking at these things? Are, are they things we already do well? Are the things that we know we could continue to improve on? And lastly, case management uh, can be very helpful in terms of doing, doing treatment and recovery for all clients, especially those with limited English literacy and with little knowledge of the treatment uh, process and the system that's uh, around treatment. So um, case management, I can't overemphasize on your own individual slash professional level, but also organizationally, how are we maintaining and managing people's access to treatment, uh, their ability to not have so many obstacles and barriers to treatment, uh, how do they access it, access outcomes and evaluation of that uh, is certainly a useful way of thinking about it. The last point um, in our trust uh, whole rubric of culturally responsive evaluation and treatment planning is uh, looking at incorporating cultural factors into treatment planning. So for example, um, looking at approaches that stress the implementation of strength-based strategies that fortify cultural heritage, the person's identity and resiliency. Uh, and then what could we do as a kind of counselor? How about designing flexible treatment plans? I know that's a challenge from time to time, but one of the things I've learned over time is that efficiency is a challenge for cultural competence in class because, you know, we had to get that done. Yesterday I had to turn in my treatment plan. I had to get all this done. But one of the things I've also seen is that when we don't do some of those things, we end up cleaning up after ourselves and having to go back and do things that we might have not had to do had we paid attention to some flexibility uh, tuning into people's cultural ways of being uh, and incorporating that into our process and figuring out best practices in terms of working with people from any background. And then this is a crucial piece, drawing upon institutions and resources in the client's cultural community. A lot of times there are things out there that we are clueless about or we don't know enough about or we just haven't been informed of. And that's part of the collaborative approach, in my opinion, with the clients is that they might know of things in their community, their church, their clan, uh, if they're among or Southeast Asian, uh, or their social club or the, the fraternity that they belong to or the barber shop or beauty shop where they go. Um, there are resources that are out there that might be really critical to us providing the best possible treatment uh, plan and uh, outcomes, but are we tuned into that? And if we if we are great, and if we're not, how do we continue to be um, tuned into it and and make that part of our process? Let's do one more uh, client scenario. So speaking of your client is a 29 year old Hmong woman who's not married and drink socially. You remember reading somewhere that clan affiliation is an important part of Hmong culture. And you know the Hmong came to the United States in large numbers from Laos after the end of the Vietnam War. How would you incorporate the client's cultural background into treatment planning? So what are your thoughts about that? Let's take a few minutes to tune in. So 
number one thought is to educate ourselves as a social worker about her cultural background. And just FYI, I was riding in this morning listening to our local uh, uh, independent radio station, WORT in Madison, and they had a speaker on this morning, Mai Zhang Bu, who is a local expert on Hmong culture here in the Madison uh, Dane County area. And they're having a Hmong Institute. Uh, well, they created a Hmong Institute, but there's a conference coming up uh, later in August. I think it's the 17th and 18th that'll cover a number of these topics. Uh, specifically, <clears throat> Hmong are really prevalent in three states. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this. California, Minnesota, and Wisconsin have the largest populations of Hmong in the country, and they're a population that a lot of times is overlooked, but they are becoming, well, they have become more and more part of our uh, communities, but also might be somewhat reticent to use our services, especially when we don't seem to be able to tune into what their needs are from their cultural perspective. So. Some of your thoughts about the client was uh, ask and learn more about cultural beliefs about drinking. Um, how asking how her situation stopped her from doing what she wanted to do in life, and how uh, can I insist assist you with your culture? Um, there's a need to know more have more information about Hmong culture and her experiences. Sometimes one person's cultural experiences is not similar to others in the same culture. Very good point. Uh, most cultures are not monolithic. People are individuals as well. So starting with where that person is, and that's one of the things, again, I go back to for motivational in interviewing is that we start where the client is. We talk about that a lot, but how much do we actually do it consistently is a challenge. Educate yourself. Ask if she has natural or paid resources in this culture. Identify resources supporting the culture and stay curious. Do not assume her level of involvement. <clears throat> Ask her to share difficulties she has experienced as she transitions to the new culture and live, living styles, language, work, transportation. Very good. Uh, does she have resources or contacts in the community who share her culture that are supportive? Because, uh, you know, people at different stages of acculturation, too. Some folks still go by the old ways and tune into uh, their traditional healing processes, and other people are more tuned into uh, American culture or the culture where you live. and. They might or might not even relate to those kinds of things. So who am I working with? How does this person see uh, what's going to be useful for them and not even from their own cultural perspective? If she identifies culture as important, ask how you might be able to incorporate it into her treatment. Very good. What would be helpful? What would, be, what would not be helpful? <laughs> Two very important things to keep in mind. Okay, uh, thanks for all those good points. And again, hopefully we can cover some of those as we get into Q&A. Um, starting to wind down a little bit. I think we're at a quarter two, if I'm not mistaken. So what questions do you have? If you have questions that we can't cover today, um, here's where you can reach me. Uh, and also, uh, I know Maureen uh, is very good about uh, posting things and keeping us tuned into information and putting things up so that you can access them later. Thanks so much, Harold. Alrighty, and uh, there were a couple of other things, Cindy, that I think Maureen might want to uh, share with folks, and then we can go into Q&A after that. That sounds great. And I just wanted to check my audio. Can you hear me OK? You're yep. fine, Laurie. OK, great. I'm excellent. 
Okay, we mentioned a few resources throughout Mr. Gates' presentation, and those links are in the, the chat transcript, but I will also post them when we post the recorded webinar with Mr. Gates' PowerPoint slides. And I also wanted to bring your attention to a new course that's available from the ATTC network that's related to the topic today. This course is called Understanding the Basics of Race, Ethnicity, and Culture. You can take it for free on Healthy Knowledge, which is the network's free online learning portal. It's the first course in a diversity suite that's being developed. And then the next webinar in Mr. Gates' series is coming up on August 8th, and he'll be talking about that tricky issue of sustaining any change in your organization. And cultural competence would be no different. How to sustain cultural competence at the individual and organizational levels. So again, August 8th from 11 to 12 Central Time. And we'll be sending a reminder, as we have with the past, uh, the past two webinars. Also about continuing education credits, you'll be getting an, an email after the webinar on, on that process. And now I would like to turn it over to the Q&A section. We did get some questions from our participants. Thanks to everyone for being so engaged in the presentation. So the first question was related to a recommendation of asking about immigration status. A couple of participants asked, how do you ask about immigration status without getting into legal trouble? Many places that I have worked have a don't ask, don't tell policy to avoid having to involve ICE. Yeah, I would just chime in on that too, uh, Maureen, that uh, if you're in an organization or agency, I would ask what the policies and procedures are around that because um, various organizations and agencies have different policies and procedures, so you want to know what those are, but also uh, what what's your professional uh, ethical standards around those kinds of things as well, and most uh, professions have ethical standards and how you deal with ethical dilemmas. So those are uh, also just ways to think about this. And if you're in solo practice, who do you get clinical supervision from and who can you turn to for support when you might bump up against something like this? Thanks, Harold. Another question that came in from Stephen Rosenthal, there are cross-cultural, mutually understood and accepted social interactions between some cultures, but are there any universally understood interactions to be used during assessments and interviews of clients or patients? That's a good question. Uh, I go back to my all-time favorite motivational interviewing. That has some ways to ask anybody any question, um, and it, it, it helps you, again, get that person's perspective because they're coming from their cultural point of view when they give you the answers or don't give you the answers. Uh, and then having a better knowledge of the demographics of your clientele, who, who are you working with? So are they indigenous people? Are they, um, say, from Eastern Europe or Southeast Asia? Uh, and then learning about some of the customs and ways of being uh, might be useful. Thanks, Harold. <clears throat> I see we have some participants. Oh, had you, did you have more to add? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, that was it. And I see we have some participants typing, so we'll see if we have some more questions coming in. A lot of people were asking about how they could view the first webinar in the series, and I just wanted to let you all know it's on the Great Lakes ATTC website. You can go to the 
banner on the left side of our Great Lakes page, look under Distance Education and you'll find recorded webinars there. Thanks, Maureen. And we're just going to wait for some more questions to come in. We've still got uh, close to eight minutes left while we're letting you think about your questions. I will tell you that uh, probably next Monday or Tuesday, you'll receive an email from me, Cindy Christie, the ATTC Network, and it'll contain information about obtaining your uh, NADAC CEU for one hour. And if you have any trouble downloading the first one, please make sure you email me and we'll make sure you get your certificate for both. It is only available for the live uh, webinars, not for the recorded ones. Are there any more questions in there, Maureen? I don't see questions. I see a lot of great feedback about the yes. presentation today. A lot of you are commenting on how you like the interaction that was involved in discussing the case scenarios. <clears throat> I, I just wanted to mention again, to um, as you're asking questions or thinking of things, then go back to either the cultural competence self-test to see where you're at, where you're good at, what you're doing well, and what are challenges still that you might want to continue to look at, and then the class standards themselves, because they help you get a better sense of how this fits into overall organizational as well as treatment planning and evaluation so that you're starting to come up with a more systematic approach to working with any client that walks in your door. And you're continuing to improve on your ability to become more culturally competent as a practitioner, but also pushing along your organization to either have a cultural competence or class a committee that's given a charge by your uh, board or ex executive director or, or uh, chief executive to actually do this on some more quarterly at minimum or monthly basis so you have a place to process all these things because stuff comes up but then what do you turn to when you need help or how do you make it become more and more part of the work you do every day. Thanks, Harold. And we do have another another question that's come in from Sarah Jerome, and she asks, uh, do you have examples of implementing the class standards outside of the clinical setting? That's a very good question. I, I think that the, <laughs> the class standards as they were re revised in 2013 um, can relate to organizations in general, not just healthcare or sub substance use disorder. So I would take a look at those initially because I'm not aware myself of ones that are, you know, how it would relate to, say, a business environment. But um, a good resource to check that I've seen is one called Reinventing Diversity by Howard Ross. It's a book that looks at how to incorporate cultural competence in the business setting. And I'm not remembering the publisher offhand, but if you wanted to send me a note or whatever, I could uh, give you that later. Um, and then the Harvard Business Review has a lot of great articles. In fact, they had a series in July about a year or so ago on diversity and inclusion and how to manage diversity and what works and what doesn't work in the business setting. Uh, that might be worth looking at. I think it was the July issue. Uh, and then um, there's some uh, Howard Goldman who does emotional intelligence. That's another area that I think can uh, help us do this work. Uh, has a whole series of monographs and a website on emotional intelligence that might be useful for how to implement some of these things from that perspective. But the class standards themselves, I think, are very useful for any organization, no matter what you know what type of work they're doing. But I understand your uh, question about it. I haven't seen many models of, on a business side. Harold, we had a request for the name of the book by Harold Ross. Uh, by Howard Ross. It's, okay. Uh, 
Reinventing Diversity. And the author is Howard Ross. Correct. All right. Looks like a quick Google search brings that up on Amazon. Yep. It's been around for a few years now. And who is the author of that emotional intelligence book you mentioned? Uh, that's um, Howard Goldman. Oh, yeah. He's the, sort of the guru on emotional intelligence. Thank you, Harold. Um, Harold, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's interested in um, learning about Hmong culture, there's a great book that you've probably read. It's called The Spirit Catches You When You Fall Down. It's excellent. Yep. I'll put a link to that in the chat box. Thanks. Okay, we still have a couple minutes if you have any last minute burning questions. I want to let you know that I'm going to leave this room open uh, for about five minutes. Once we're finished, I'll stop the audio, but all of you can scroll back through the comment feature and go up and collect the links that folks added, as well as downloading the slides and other resources if you, hadn't have, if you haven't had a chance to do that yet. And then please don't hesitate to email me or Maureen Fitzgerald. We can get you to Harold or get you answers and uh, let us know what you need. Thanks, okay, Cindy. Lots of resources. Yeah, go ahead, Maureen. Another question about a recording of today's webinar. It will be up on the Great Lakes ATTC website probably within a week or 10 days. And thanks to Michelle for correcting me. It was Daniel Goldman, not Howard Goldman. So thanks. I was on a Howard roll. All right. Well, I have uh, one minute before the top of the hour, so uh, I see all your comments coming in, thanking our wonderful presenter. So big thank you to Harold, and, and we're going to have him one more time in August. The rest of you have a fantastic day. Again, we'll leave the room open for a few minutes for you to gather up any of the resources. And I'm going to say goodbye and shut off the audio. Take care, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, bye everybody. Bye-bye, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Chris, are you still there? Yeah. Oh, OK. I guess I didn't need anything, huh? <laughs> Okay. Green like you know, sweet.